Hey, Mike here with Canadian Musician. Uh, right now, I have the absolute pleasure of being in the apartment of this gentleman next to me, a guy who's probably seen and met everybody and everything in uh, Canadian music and beyond over the last, what's it been, Richard, 40, 50 years? Mm, 50 years, 50. full time. So, of course, Richard Flohill, I should, I should at least say his name before we get into the conversation, because God knows once we start talking, um, Richard has an awful lot of stories to share. But Richard, of course, over these last 50 years, uh, it's hard to really even put a label on your career, but publicist, music journalist and editor, concert promoter, and kind of just a man about town who, like I said, has known just about everybody in and around Canadian music over these over this time and a man not short of stories as anyone who's ever talked to him uh can uh, can testify so Richard I've been looking forward to this conversation but thanks a lot for doing this how are you oh, doing it's a pleasure I, I, I you're right I do have a lot of stories and I think the reality is that if you work as I call it on the edge of music mm-hmm. Uh, for a long time and you don't have any stories you've kind of blown it (laughs) somebody said to me oh you know everybody I said no of course I don't know everybody but I do know a lot of people and that's the nature of the job and if you didn't know any people you blew it have you been doing all this yeah exactly (laughs) so yeah I'm I I've got all these stories and um some of them are very, most of them are funny. At least I, they're the ones I remember. I remember the funny ones. Funny ones. And there's, there's so many that it's beyond belief. Yeah. Uh, just to set the foundation for those who maybe aren't um, familiar with your background, um, as people might be able to tell from the accent, you were born in the UK. Born in the UK. Um, but you've been here since the mid to late 50s. Um, really been in the music industry in earnest since the mid 60s. Um, but just to kind of set the foundation, A, how did you end up in Canada after being born in the UK, growing up there during the war, and then how did you end up in the music industry? Well, I, 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 I was apprenticed at six years, 16 years old, um, as a boy reporter, junior journalist, they called us. And um, basically, uh, all the crap jobs on in, in the newsroom devolved to me. Yeah. Um, and eventually, after three years, I, they had a lot of exams, and I passed them all, and I won an award as Junior Journalist of the Year, um, not only on my paper, but on the 40 other papers that the group, mm-hmm. the newspaper owners had. And I, I, so I suppose I was fairly good at that. And then I was a huge blues fan, huge jazz fan, I thought, I could go to America and I could meet Muddy Waters and mm. da 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 da. And um, I went to the American consulate and this was in the 50s and they wanted to know whether my grandmother was a communist. Okay. Now, come on. <laughs> I went to the, I mean, this is obviously a non starter. So I wound up going to the Canadian consulate where basically they said, you know, is your heart beating and do you have a passport? <laughs> and, now, and I was here, I think, I, I can't be sure, but I was here within three months yeah. of, of, of applying. And uh, when I came to Toronto, it was a very, very boring wasp city with a kind of interesting sort of underbelly of vice and alcohol mm. and, and nonsense and music. Mm. And I tell this story, but on the, my very first day in Canada, I walked down Young Street and I saw a sign outside a bar and it said, Earl Hines and his All-Stars. And I went, oh, and I knew every one of those musicians from, from records, 78 RPM records that yeah. I had. And I went into the bar, it was in the afternoon, I said, Earl Hines is here. I go, yeah. So well, well, the Earl Hines who played with Louis Armstrong in the twenties and had a big band in the forties. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, how much is it to get in? He said it's free, but you have to have two drinks. I went, this is incredible. <laughs> the next day, I found a Dixieland Jazz Club in Toronto, very much like the ones I used mm-hmm. to go to in England. The day after that, I walked, walked down Young Street a bit further, turned on. I think Queen Street, mm-hmm. and um, 
there was a rotund black pianist called Oscar Peterson playing <laughs> in this bar. And it was the same thing, free, but... Was Oscar Peterson known it, then? No. Well, he was, but I mean, well, he, he, was, he was a jazz style. pianist yeah. out of Montreal. Yeah. That was what he was. And it was great. And the night after that, I went to Maple Leaf Gardens for the Parade of Stars, featuring 16-year-old boy wonder from Ottawa, Canada, Paul Anker. <laughs> And also, John Lee Hooker, Clyde McFadder, uh, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, wow, that's John Lee <laughs> Hooker. Oh you know, God. it was like, wow. Yeah. And that convinced me to yeah. stay. What was Because growing up, and I've heard like the, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones yeah. and them tell those stories about growing up in the UK and getting the, the American jazz and blues records. Um, I, but when you came to Canada, what was the audience like? Because... So, you know, from what the stories I hear, it's like, you know, a lot of uh, working class and middle class white kids in the UK buying these records from American sailors or from stories importing them and that kind of stuff. But when you came to Canada, when you were going to these jazz clubs and that kind of thing, was it a particularly white audience or were you standing oh, yeah. out? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, when I started going to Chicago, that was a totally different okay. trip. Um, uh, first time I, I went to Chicago, I arrived by train, had a backpack, and that yeah. was it. And uh, I knew that Muddy Waters was playing in a bar called Smitty's Corner on mm -hmm. the south side. And I sort of walked out of the station. The first cab, it said Smitty's Corner, 47th and Vincent. Not going there, man. <laughs> and after a while, I thought, I need a black cab driver. So I finally said, what are you going there for? So well, I don't know. Okay, have you got any money? He said, yes. He said, put it in your shoe. Okay. Anyway, he walked me into the club when we arrived. And I went to the bartender and, you know, in my best English accent, you know, um, my friend in England, Mr. Chris Barber, who had, had done a tour in England with, with Muddy, which I'd not seen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the just guy said, Mud! And the band was off stage, and he came over and looked me up and down, shook me gravely by the hand, and I was accepted. Although when I'd walked in, everybody stopped what they were doing. <laughs> like, who is this guy? He's, he's obviously dropped in from Mars. Yeah. And then uh, three or four years later, I went back to Chicago and went to the west side to see Howling Wolf. Mm -hmm. And the reception in that club was not curiosity. It was downright hostile. Mm -hmm. They did not want me there. Mm -hmm. But sitting right at the front next to the band was this Mexican woman, and she brought me over and said, you're a stranger here. I said, yes, I am. How could you tell? <laughs> and she says, well, in my line of work, I deal with strangers all the time, but I'm not working tonight, so you're going to sit down here and you're going to uh, buy me a drink or two and maybe we'll dance, and if anybody fucks with you, they're going to be fucking with me and they won't like it. Okay. So I was protected nice. all night by a Mexican hooker, <laughs> and Howling Wolf was the most scary, frightening human I'd ever met. Really? I, well, I didn't meet him that yeah. night, but I met him a few years later. Uh, we brought him into Toronto for the Mariposa Folk Festival mm -hmm. on Toronto Island. And he was gentle and lovely and kind. He was just like so big and so ugly. <laughs> hey, he was a gem. He really was. <laughs> so, I, so I started doing shows. I started bringing these people to Canada. I brought Muddy, and, and some more arcane people, Sleepy John Estes and Robert Nighthawk, obscure. Well, actually, I, I want to find out more about how that happens. Because when you came to Canada, you, you said you were a journalist yeah. in the UK. You came to Canada. You had a, like a string of jobs, like editing trade magazines of various yeah, kinds and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I couldn't get a newspaper job. And, uh, but you obviously, you come with this massive love of music and you're doing yeah. your own exploring of it. But, you know, it's a different thing to actually start promoting concerts, start in, you know, bringing artists in from the States and that kind of stuff. Wait, what was the first time you did that? How does that happen? I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was maybe 1959. We brought in a guy called Sleepy John Estes. And Estes was blind. 
narcoleptic, which is where he gets his name from, <laughs> he'd fall asleep at the drop of a hat, <laughs> um, uh, completely illiterate, uh, pretty well toothless, um, who wrote some of the most amazing, and I wouldn't call them blues, but yes, they were, but they were folk songs. They were about people in this little town of Brownsville, Tennessee. Uh, Lawyer Clark, the only man I know who can make water run upstream. You know, oh, okay, cool. But here's an illiterate man who could create this kind of um, poetry, I suppose. Um, and I'd been to Chicago, and there was a guy in Chicago called Bob Kester, who's still alive, and he runs the Jazz and Blues Record Mart, which is a big record shop. And um, my stupid brain that forgets so much remembers that it was at 7 West Grand Avenue. <laughs> How do I remember that? And um, he... He had Sleepy John Estes was on his record label, Delmark Records. So I called Bob, can we, so we, he came up with a couple of musicians and we put him on in a tiny little club mm -hmm. and we went to all our friends and said, give us $10 mm -hmm. and then any other tickets we sell, mm -hmm. we'll give you your money back. Mm -hmm. So everybody got a ticket for ten bucks and got nine twenty-five back, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we didn't know what we were doing. And then I remembered that we hadn't paid for the poster, so okay. I did lose sixty bucks on the whole deal in the end. Um, and that was a pretty incredible. Moment. It was done in a tiny little club called the First Floor Club, which was at Blur and Young, very close to Blur, and Young, where the big reference library is now. Okay. And then after a while, we brought in Muddy Waters mm. for a week. <laughs> and somewhere, and I can't remember, but somewhere I have a record of who else was in town. Lionel Hampton, Buddy Tate, Zoot Sims. I mean, no wonder we lost money. I mean, we had so much competition, it was ridiculous. And how old were you at this time? <sighs> 26, something like that, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and then we brought in a guy called Robert Nighthawk, who was amazing, and we actually recorded him here in Toronto, and finally put the, the records, mm -hmm. he made five tracks that were usable, mm -hmm. and uh, they are on Stony Plain Records, he got put in. Anyway, so I, I, then in the mid 60s, I started getting ambitious, mm -hmm. and I brought in B.B. King, and again, the gods were kind. Um, King has uh, only had one hit. Okay. The thrill is gone. Mm -hmm. And between the time I booked him and the time the show happened, that hit broke. Okay. Nice. And we did it That's in Massey time. Hall, and uh, it was it was packed. Yeah. And the tickets were two fifty, three fifty, and four fifty. Wow. And Years later, about five years ago, B was still playing at Massey Hall. Mm -hmm. And I was backstage. I don't know why. Maybe I had something to do with the opening artist. I don't know. And B's band is on stage. They're playing the play on number. And B sees me and he's ready to go on. He's got his guitar on. And, and he sees me and he hugs me and says, he must have lost money all those years ago when we played here. I said, no, man. I said, I actually made $700. I said, you set me on the road to ruin. <laughs> he said, happy to have helped. Walked on stage. <laughs> Bang. Oh, it was like, I have the fondest memories of him. Yeah. How? Because you're not, you're not the only young white kid at the time that has a love of jazz and blues. So what, what was it about you that allowed this to happen? Uh, that allowed you to have uh, to pull this off, and not only that for the you know these American black artists who are world know. wary for a good reason to trust you. you know I, I mean? didn't. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and after we did BB King, a couple of years later, I did a show at Massey called Blue Monday. The lesson for everybody in music is never do anything on Monday. Take the time off and have a nap. Anyway, I lost $1,200 I didn't have. Mm -hmm. It was a memorable show. Bobby Blue Bland was 
uh, underestimated singer. And he was a singer. He didn't play an instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a buddy guy was on that show. And the last ever appearance of, a, uh, of an American musician called Lonnie Johnson, who was an amazing guitar player who lived in, lived in Toronto at that time, he would been he'd been in hospital. He'd had a stroke. Blah blah blah, and we brought him on stage, mm -hmm. and he sang two songs and left with this huge standing ovation, with tears rolling down his cheeks. It was like so moving. I don't care that I lost money that I didn't have, because yeah. the next morning I quit smoking, and I was doing two and a half packs a day. So God bless him for losing me money <laughs> every time i'd see bobby before he passed i would see him on the road somewhere and i'd say thank you i i really owe you man <laughs> so i you know and then i started doing other shows and started doing publicity for shows i did publicity for the mariposa festival which i'd gone to in 65 because I was the blues expert, yeah. so-called. And it sounds like from from what you've told me before, it sounds like this trip to the 65 Mariposa Folk Festival becomes a turning point for Changed you. Changed my whole life. Yeah. I I get evangelical about about folk festivals because you, you go to them and you may go because, oh, so-and-so is headlining. Mm -hmm. And then you hear somebody you've never heard of mm -hmm. who blows you away. Last year at Mariposa there was two sisters who call themselves Larkin Poe. I'd never heard of them. They absolutely blew my socks off. <laughs> Amazing musicians, lovely people, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, the first time I went to Mariposa to do a, host a, a blues workshop, whatever that was, and it was Sun House, Sunny Terry and Brownie McGee, and a woman from Detroit who Bonnie Raitt later took up with called Sippy Wallace. Okay. Um, and it was, but that weekend I met, well, the 65 and 66 festivals kind of conflate with each other. Mm -hmm. But over those two festivals, I met Gordon Lightfoot, Ian and Sylvia, um, Phil Oakes, Leonard Cohen, a young girl from from nowhere, Saskatchewan, called Joni Anderson. Um, on and on and on and on, and it just changed everything. So I immediately volunteered to do the publicity for the festival, and a few years later, they made me the artistic director. I saw it was Joni Anderson later, Joni Mitchell. Yes. Okay. But she I, had, I actually didn't know Joni she, Anderson was her original name. Yeah, she hadn't married Chuck Mitchell, who was a Ne'er do well, ne'er do well. Not very good folky out of Detroit. Okay, but I think they'd had an interesting pelvic affiliation, and uh, they were ch uh, pregnant, and da 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 da. Anyway, so Joni was. Uh, I remember she came back to the festival the following year with exactly the same songs, and I remember um, Estelle Klein, who was the woman who really made not only that festival, but the, created the template for all the festivals, folk festivals in Canada. And uh, I gotta tell you, Canadian folk festivals, you know, get, I mean, the Vancouver Folk Festival took a huge hit when whoever it was put on something in Pemberton nearby the same weekend. Yeah. It was a kind of a screw you mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. The Van Vancouver Folk Festival still goes on. Pemberton is yeah. a vague memory. Yeah. These commercial festivals come in and they don't really engage in the community that they happen in. Mm -hmm. They kind of descend, yeah. do the thing, and then go. Yeah. Whereas the smart festivals in Canada, and there are, there are, I think, 28 festivals in Ontario every summer. But the big ones, um, the Stan Rogers Festival down east mm -hmm. in, in Canso, Nova Scotia, um, and then Mariposa, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, Vancouver, Vancouver Island. These mm -hmm. these festivals go from strength to strength. They still exist. Mm -hmm. They're part every 
Last year I went to six festivals in five weeks. Yeah. This summer I'm going to do the same thing again. Do you think, and this is in a sense kind of jumping into the present or just in the general industry talk, but having that ecosystem of festivals and that folk community from city to city that's uh, you are creating a community, like you say, has that given Canadian folk and roots artists an advantage over the years? Oh, for sure. I mean, they, we, these festivals always had, you know, Canadian artists, and occasionally, because in the old days, everybody got played um, AF of M scale. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then it became kind of silly because, you know, suddenly we were getting James Taylor mm-hmm. for, you know, what, $87 a day. <laughs> And then we'd pay his hotel, and then we'd pay his meals, and then we'd pay his transportation. Mm-hmm. And then it, it slowly changed. So now the festival circuit, the folk festival circuit, is in the same position as commercial festivals mm-hmm. in the sense that the agents are the ones that win. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, I want this artist. Oh, cool. Um, how much you offer? Oh, we'll offer this. Okay. Then the agent said, I'll call you back tomorrow. Meanwhile, he calls the festival down the road and mm-hmm. said, do you want so-and-so mm-hmm. uh, if you can do better than... Yeah. And so the price gets... Yeah, you start jockeying jo- festivals yeah. against each other. Yeah. And it's very difficult. Mariposa this week um, did not have a Saturday night headliner. Right. Uh, they had Sunday and Friday right. sorted. Yeah. And I said, but you don't need a headliner. You, you, you're going to sell out. It's Saturday night in Aurelia, and it's a lovely sight. Yeah. It's an island. And they said, yeah, I know. But so at the very last minute, and I won't say who it is because they haven't announced it, and I don't know when this is going to get used, but they, um, they got a headliner. But okay. who, is, who is a Canadian artist who's really a pop singer? Okay. But that's fine. Last year at Mariposa... Uh, walk off the earth mm-hmm. were almost the opening yeah. uh, opening artists yeah. and they were fabulous and that's kind of happened to a number of genre specific yes. festivals over the year as everyone's always pointed out ottawa blues festival is not a blues festival anymore by any means <laughs> I did <a laughs> but it can still get a great lineup i can <laughs> i i yeah i did a count actually just the other day on a facebook post that there were 111 artists mm-hmm. booked so far Eight of them are identifiably blues artists, yeah. <laughs> but that okay, I can live with that. Yeah. I've gone, I've gone to see, oh, whoever's headlining this year, you know, Miley Cyrus or yeah. whoever it is, yeah. and as I'm passing by to go to that, here is Matt Anderson. I've never heard of him. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and then and that's why. Artists like playing these festivals mm-hmm. and why in the summer it's the major breakthrough for any artist. Get on a festival mm-hmm. um, and you'll you see what happens. And mm-hmm. uh, an American agents and artists who have their shit together want to do those festivals because it's mm-hmm. a breakthrough. Those artists in the States, is, I can think of a couple... Todd Snyder and Paul Thorne, writer, who are, do okay in the States and never come here. Yeah. The only way they're going to make an impact here is to come in on a folk festival um, and just blow everyone away. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Poltz, who was originally from Halifax but now lives in Nashville, is, in my view, probably the best one man and a guitar performer I've ever seen. Okay. I've seen a few. <laughs> he's funny, he's an excellent player, his songs are, and it's improvised from day one. Hmm. Steve Poltz played Mariposa last year, he'll play it again this year. But meanwhile, he now sells out two nights at the Dakota. In, you know, in the fall, he'll play a bigger venue, I presume. Mm-hmm. And it's, but it's exposure, it's his exposure at folk festivals that that allow him to reach a wider audience for other times of the year. So to go back to uh, the chronology here, after those mm. uh, the Mariposa festivals in 65, 66, 
Um, you get very involved in the folk and roots uh, side of things. Um, essentially, where do you go from there? Like, at what point did you transition from, and at what point did you transition from concert promotion to publicity, and also starting up magazines well, and that kind of really thing? Well, it really came the other way around. I I got a job with with Capac, which was one of the two organizations that eventually became a SOCAN, and uh, my experience editing trade magazines led me to. Um, a job doing um, a music magazine called The Canadian Composer, which I did for 20 years. And I got a free office, and I was it was a half-time job, and I was allowed to do my own other stuff, which I was declared to them, so, you know. And I'd been there, I think, maybe not very long, a few months, and one day I fell over Gordon Lightfoot in a bar, <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm editing this magazine up at, at Calpac. He said, oh, I'm going in the office tomorrow. I'm transferring from BMI in the U.S. to Calpac. And I said, well, come to my office first. I'll introduce you to everybody. So he, my office on a different floor. I took him upstairs, and I introduced him to the general manager and the head of repertoire and this and that, and then left him to sign his contract. And about an hour later, the, gen the boss of the whole place called me and said, do you actually know musicians? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, oh, come on upstairs. So basically, performing rights societies, in the simplest terms, are divided into two sets of people. Mm -hmm. One is, who is using music and we're going to charge them for it and collect the money? Yeah. And the other half is, whose music got played so that we can give them the money we collected to them. Yeah. So it's lawyers and accountants mm -hmm. and collection agencies. Yeah. They're not musicians, and they don't really know much about music. Okay. So I would, they said, well, okay, and they gave me an American Express card and said, go ahead and take musicians to lunch. And so I was a kind of the house freak in those days. It would have gone. So I did that for all my time there for a total of 23 years. I spent every year I went to Midem in the south of France, mm -hmm. which I could never understand that. Here's this huge music industry convention, international, worldwide, 10,000 delegates in the south of France. Nobody at SOCAN, at uh, CAPAC, yeah. wanted to go. I said, what? Uh, it's the last week in January. Toronto, south of France. <laughs> well, so Were they just thinking, well, we're a Canadian organization. What do we need to go to an international no, they event for? They realized they had to have some kind of international footprint. And, and in the years since, they, I mean, SOCAN today is arguably... Well, it's not the largest performing rights site. It's certainly the most technologically advanced. Yeah. The most yeah. they lead the way in all sorts of in all sorts yeah. of ways. Had a number of conversations yeah. with folks at Sokin over the last few years about a number of the things yeah. they're doing from blockchain to AI to yes, all this exactly. other stuff. Yeah. They're really ahead of the curve. But in those days, they didn't want to go. Yeah, I said, well, I'll go. <laughs> so I went. I think for seventeen years, and. It used to just get me through the winter. <laughs> the idea that it, and sometimes it would rain, but it never snowed. And we're all wandering around La Croissette, you know, in t shirts while little French ladies with their poodles are all walking along, like wrapped in fur coats. They think it's terribly cold. <laughs> we were, oh, you don't know what cold is, love, you know? <laughs> and and the, the, the years at Midem were. Uh, uh, amazing. Yeah. It was so. Oh, okay. I'm not even going to go to. That's funny. Stories. I've ne I've never been to meet him, but like, uh, to me, it struck me. It's always struck me as a different thing than than like a Canadian Music Week or something. Oh, that that's kind of thing. It, was, it always seemed more of like a business event for label executives than anything else. Yes, is that... it, it that is exactly what it is. And there's relatively little music. Yeah. But there is some live music every time. I saw Tori Amos there. I saw Willie Nelson there. I saw James Brown. Oh, James Brown story? Okay. <laughs> yeah, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> James Brown, is. It, he did a show. And it, the audience are all music guys, you know? Yeah. And we all sit there with our 
I, arms crossing. Um, I've always said I've always said I feel bad for any artist that has to play for an audience of industry people. Oh, <laughs> it, it was it. It took him three quarters of the show to get us to clap. Yeah. Let alone, <laughs> you know, we always see. You know, he's a bit fat, isn't he? He doesn't do the splits the way he used to do. Well, anyway. So the, afterwards, there was a press conference in the Palais de Festival. Maybe 70 people, pen and paper, writers, radio, film, TV, whatever. 70 people with cameras. And, and he's two hours late. <laughs> so being an impatient guy, I am and not. I, I beard one of the medium officials and say, this is unacceptable. What? What? Oh, monsieur, we are having a terrible time. We are accidentally sending Mr. Brown a white limousine. He refused to write in it. We have to have a black limousine. I said, yeah, but he's staying at the Majestic Hotel. It's across the road. <laughs> he, could, he could come across the road in two minutes with a couple of minders. He says, sir, you expect the Godfather of Soul to walk? <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> He, that guy had an ego bigger than outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> he did the same thing in Toronto a few years later. I remember he had some press conference that he showed up ridiculously late for. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. I, I guess I've, I've heard like stories about that about James Brown and other people, and I guess from their perspective, it's always more, it's less about like you know not wanting to walk than just show the respect that I've come to earn. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, yeah. um, but I think if you spend your working life every night with a whole band on stage going, James Brown, James Brown, James Brown, you, you, your head is yeah. going to be yeah. rather larger than yeah. the average person. <laughs> so they, you know, I, I, I only met one Beatle, and I met John Lennon. I thought, what an arrogant asshole this guy is. Yeah. Now I look back and I know why. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this was. A, uh, I've I've only very glancingly met Bob Dylan, and I thought, no wonder he's he's a curmudgeon and he doesn't talk to people, and he, you know, you're not if you're on the same show with him, mm -hmm. and you meet, you're not allowed to look at him. Yeah. You have to avert your eyes, and you're told this. Yeah. I mean, to re your eyes. I've heard of people touring with Bob Dylan for like almost an entire year doing countless shows and not meeting him once. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's insane. Um, and and I, I mean, the pressures of stardom at that level, no wonder you go crazy. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants a piece of your ass. Yeah. And, and you don't know whether they're your friend or whether yeah. they want something. Mm -hmm. I guess also, I guess there's always going to just be a personality aspect to it too, because then you also hear the, on the flip side stories of people that are, you know, arguably as famous or close to it, who are also known for being incredibly generous people. Yes. Like I, um, a friend of mine who's a reporter at the CBC, I always remember a story she told me about Stevie Wonder, and this is I don't know, maybe ten years ago or something like that. Stevie Wonder, maybe a couple years less. Stevie Wonder is headlining, doing the big free outdoor show in Montreal mm -hmm. during the International uh, Jazz Fest. And he was doing this pre-show press conference or whatever in the afternoon. And she was telling me, you know, this one young guy from the press had asked Stevie Wonder a pretty technical question about piano playing or keyboard playing mm -hmm. or something like that. And Stevie Wonder was like, that's a great question. It's a bit tough for me to get into it in like a press conference like this. Come see me afterwards. Uh, the guy came up to Stevie Wonder afterwards, like, hey, Stevie, I'm the guy that asked the question, blah, blah, blah. In the press room at the Jazz Festival headquarters in Montreal, there's a grand piano. And Stevie Wonder apparently sat down with the guy at the piano for an hour just going over yeah. technical things. Every now and then that kind of of generosity, you know, comes from sometimes surprising people mm -hmm. that you, you didn't kind of expect that. Uh, and I've been the, the, the one memory I have at the Winnipeg Folk Festival a few years ago. The festival is actually held 40 miles out of Winnipeg in a park. Mm -hmm. So back at the hotel, the parties are not very good because every, half of people are still out in the site or coming back. And I was in the party room 
at a table. We had a beer in front of us with John Prine and Guy Clark. Guy was writing a song about rambling Jack Elliott. Um, and John was writing a song called Jesus, The Missing Years. Neither of them had quite finished their songs. Okay. And they're swapping them back and forth. To, you know, why don't you change this? And if you took the bridge and... And I'm sitting for once in my life without my mouth going at 100 miles an hour, just going, you know, the chance to see two masters in, in, a, in an empty party room in a hotel mm -hmm. with guitars trying to figure out yeah. songs that each of them made major songs in their, in their repertoires, you know. It was that. So you get that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the reason I love going to folk festivals, especially now after 50 years of this, they give me a backstage pass. And I miss a lot of music because I'm backstage shooting the shit with whoever it is, you know. Um, I should...